Welcome and thanks for worshiping with us today. I'm Nathan and this is Jan and we're on staff at NCC. We'd like to highlight a couple of things coming up. Be sure to check your program or our website for more opportunities to connect. Our preschool camp last week was full and the kids had a blast. We have more caps coming up for preschoolers through high schoolers. We also have summer jams, which are mornings full of fun for elementary students. If you are interested in serving at any of these events, please connect with us. Check out our website for all of the details. And Father's Day is next weekend and we have a great day planned. We'll have gifts for all the dads, a photo op and more. If you were unable to participate in the parent-child dedication on Mother's Day, we're gonna have another one next weekend as well. Please go to mindwcc dedication to register. And please take a minute to fill out a Connect card by following the link below. Let us know how we can pray for you. If you would like to volunteer, or if you would like information on any of the ministries or events. And if you'd like to give financially as an act of worship to God, please go to mindw.cc give. We will have a time of communion later in the service. We do this each week to remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Take a few minutes to get your bread, juice, or whatever, whatever you have at home ready. Thank you so much for joining us. Now let's worship together. How you doing church? Good to see you. We're so glad you're joining us here. Won't you stand on your feet? We're going to sing out about shining a light. Waking up to another life. No more sorrow and no more night. You're the light. Let it shine now. Let it shine now. Burning bright because we're not ashamed. Got a world to illuminate. You're the light, let it shine now. Let it shine now. You're the light, let it shine now. Let it shine now. Nothing can stand against us. Our praise will break the darkness. We declare the King. Your name be glorified. 
NCC, it is so great to worship with you online this morning. And no matter where you are or what's going on in your life, I hope you are encouraged and confident that we have a loving God on our side. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here at Northwest Christian Church. And we would love to know who you are and how we can help and pray for you. So feel free to say hi in the chat area. You can also fill out a Connect card online. Now, I'm so excited to start this series called Seriously. And I truly believe that amazing things can happen when we live our life, when we listen to the words of Jesus. Now, later in the service, there's gonna be an opportunity to have communion. Feel free to use this time to prepare for that now. All right, right now, we're gonna keep lifting God up in worship. Excited to worship with you today. Wanna to declare this? Declare this was one loud choir tonight. Hey, two.
Amen.
sing that again. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear. Thank you. Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Your name is so, so good. You always walk beside us. The fear doesn't stand a chance in your name. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. You are who you said you were. You've done what you said you would do. We can trust in you. We celebrate you. We look forward to the future and what you have for it, and that you'll be along with it, with us for it. Thank you, God, for this time. And thank you for this church. And all God's people said, Amen. You may have a seat. The task is to take any word from the dictionary, alter it by adding, subtracting, or changing one letter, and then you supply a new definition. Here are some of the past winners. Inoculati, to take coffee intravenously when you're running late. Or how about this one? Intoxication. Euphoria at getting a tax refund, which lasts until you realize it was your money to start with. Or reincarnation, coming back to life as a hillbilly. I like bozone, the substance surrounding stupid people that stops bright ideas from penetrating. The bozone layer, unfortunately, shows little sign of breaking down in the near future. And the last one, giraffiti, vandalism spray painted very, very high. Now, I share these because sometimes it's hard to believe the definition of words. We think we know the word. But then there's some twist, a subtle difference, and it changes everything. And sometimes you go, seriously? I mean, it's a question, an exasperated question. You mean what? Well, today we start a series straight from the mouth of Jesus. It's a very famous section of scripture, often called the Beatitudes. And each verse begins with the word blessed. And we're going to hear Jesus' words. And our first reaction, or mine at least, is seriously? I mean, what are you saying, Jesus? Seriously, this is blessed? Yet, God gives us standard of truth. He gives us a way to live life optimally, to live an abundant life, to be blessed. Now, your version might translate blessed as happy. Happy is the one who. And happy, that's an okay word. It might be the best standalone word to translate the word blessed too. But the difference between the world's idea of blessed and Jesus' idea of blessed doesn't really compare. Let me illustrate it this way. You've probably heard these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among those life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, according to our Constitution, this country is established in part so that people can pursue happiness, it's basic to the American dream. In fact, if you ask the average person, what do you want out of life? Most will say, I just want to be happy. I want happiness for me, my family, my friends. So the next question, well, what would it take to make you happy? That was the question asked to 52,000 Americans in psychology today. Their answers, friends, social life, job, being in love, recognition, success, sex, personal growth, good finances, a house, being attractive or beautiful, the city that I live in, my religion, recreation, being a parent. I mean, all kinds of answers. But it's interesting that most answers are about external situations instead of the internal. So the popular idea is that happiness is all about having the right circumstances. It's a then and then type of thinking. When I get out of school, then I'll be happy. Right, graduates? Or when I get a job, then I'll be happy. When I get married, when I have kids, then I'll be happy. 
When the kids leave home, then I'll be really happy. Just kidding. But happiness, it's a common pursuit. And yet not many people are really finding it. You ask the average person, are you happy? Uh, sometimes, uh, 50% of the time. But indications are that people aren't really content with their life. So out of all the subject matters that Jesus can choose to speak on, when he starts this Sermon on the Mount, he chooses how to be happy because he knows it's what everybody is searching for, but very few people find it. All right, so here we go. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now look at those first four words. Blessed are the poor. And some of you are going, yes, I win. I'm broke. This is great news, right? Or maybe you're thinking, ah, Jesus, he must have been a little bit nervous. I mean, his first sermon and all, so he probably misspoke. He meant to say, blessed are the rich, because this is the equation that works. We equate a blessed life with being rich. We even use those words interchangeably. When you're with a rich person, you say, man, what a beautiful home. Or that's an awesome car. They don't say, thank you, I, I'm so rich. What do they say? Thanks, I'm so, what? I'm so blessed. We equate being blessed with being rich. And Jesus, his first sermon, first thing out of his mouth, blessed are the poor. Now, of course, he's talking about more than just money and material stuff. Blessed are the poor in spirit. But the word poor, it could be translated destitute, bankrupt. Seriously, Jesus? So when I'm bankrupt in spirit, that's when I'm going to be blessed? Yeah. Well, what's this even mean? If Jesus begins this way, saying that this is what leads to a blessed life, it seems to me like we better figure this out. My dad grew up very poor. They moved around a lot in the South. They would pick crops and then they'd go wherever the next crop is ready. We had a chicken house growing up when I was a kid. And one time he points to it and he says that our chicken house was better than the place that he and his sister slept and lived for years. And then we talked about some of the hard times. And then he said that the hardest thing for him was asking for help. Not what I expected. I expected him to say the hardest part for me were the cold nights or the hungry stomach. But the hardest part is asking for help. He said a couple times they did ask for help. And I asked, well, what made you finally ask for help? We had no other choice. We had no other choice, so we asked for help. I think this is in part what it means to be poor in spirit. When you and I get to the point where we have no other choice but to ask for help, it's at that point when we're blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It means that you reach a point where you realize that you are broke. Spiritually, you're bankrupt. You cannot pay your bill. You can't dig yourself out of the hole. You can't take care of yourself. You can't fix your problems. You can't redeem your situation. You can't put all those pieces back together. You declare bankruptcy. And Jesus says, in that moment, blessed are you. Blessed are you when you declare spiritual bankruptcy. Tim Keller, a popular author, offers this definition of what Jesus means by poor in spirit. It means seeing you are deeply in debt before God and that you have no ability to even begin to redeem yourself. And God's free generosity to you, at an infinite cost to him, it's your only hope. But he adds this, that's hard for us today. As Americans, this is really a difficult thing for us. Keller explains it this way, most of us believe that God owes us something, that he ought to answer our prayers. He should bless us for the many good things that we've done. And then he says something that I believe is spot on. He says, we can actually say that we are middle class in spirit, that we feel we've earned a certain standing with God through our hard work, and that we believe that the success and the resources that we have are primarily due to our own industry, to our own energy. So not poor in spirit, middle class in spirit. I wonder, is that me? Is that you? I mean, I've worked hard. I mean, God owes me something for my hard work and then the good things that I've done for him. And this is exactly what keeps so many of us from experiencing God's blessing in our lives. Because we approach God 
as if we have something to offer. We, in essence, try to bribe God with things that we have that were already his. God, look what I've done. God, look what I've accomplished. God, you owe me. But again, Jesus says, it's not until we admit bankruptcy that we can be truly blessed by God. He says, blessed are those who admit their poverty. This is also hard for us, I think, because we all like to maintain an image. We want to look like we have it all together. So someone is in poor in spirit and acknowledges they don't have it all together. And so we're like that person who's ready to declare financial bankruptcy, but they're still driving around in a brand new car because they want to keep that facade up as long as possible. And spiritually, I know that I can be the same way. I just don't acknowledge the mess. I don't want anybody to see inside. I don't want to say that I need help. And yet here comes Jesus. He says, David, you'll be blessed when you reach that point. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the DIY network, the do-it-yourself network. They had a show called Renovation Realities. It's typically a couple, and it's a happy couple to begin the show. They begin with identifying a home remodeling or renovation project, a project that they're going to do on their own. It's DIY, right? Do it yourself. And they're going to do it on their own without any professional help, none whatsoever. And they start out, and they are so excited. This is going to be so good. They give each other a kiss and a high five, and then the music begins. And then they start with that demolition work. I mean, that's always fun, right, to destroy some stuff. Well, by the time it's commercial time, they now hate each other because everything is falling apart. They have a mess on their hands. They don't know what they're going to do. They've already done some things that have cost them extra money. It's a mess. The commercial break comes, and the wife says something along the lines, I, I knew this was a bad idea, but she didn't. She thought it was a great idea. And then he says, I've got this under control. But he doesn't. He's not even close. It's not until they recognize the reality that their renovation, it's going to be hard for them. That's when it begins to turn around that they acknowledge, we need help. We can't do this on our own. And Jesus says, when you realize the truth about your situation, when you realize that you are poor in spirit, this is when you finally open up the door to God's blessing in your life. It's when a, a child finally comes to a parent without making demands, without making excuses, without justification, and they just say, Mom, Dad, will you help me? They absolutely will. And Jesus says, it's at this point that you and I can be blessed. But we've got to reach that point where we say, I can't fix it. I can't renovate it. I can't patch it up by myself. So being poor in spirit, in part, is reaching that point where you realize you're broke. And then I would add this. You also reach a point where you ask for help. You just, you just ask for help. But my dad's right. It's one of the hardest things for us to do. We're just not good at asking for help. Why? I think because to ask for help means that we can't help ourselves. And this goes against what many of us have been taught. There, of course, is a self-help movement that's blossomed into this $11 billion industry of people who learn how to help themselves. There are more than 85,000 self-help books in print. So why are we so into this? $11 billion, 85,000 books. Why? Why are we so into this? Well, any parent who has kids knows exactly why. Because by the time that our kids were two, they all know how to say, I can do it myself. I can do this myself. No, you can't. And they come back, I can do it by myself. There's just something within us that wants to do it ourselves. We got ourselves into this situation. I'll get myself out of it. If I really wanted to, I could fix this problem. I can do it myself. And when we say this, because after all, there are no awards at sports banquets for being poor in spirit, right? No awards for saying, I can't do this. I need somebody else's help. We don't celebrate this in our culture. You don't put that on your resume. Uh, I don't know what to do here. I'm going to need some help on this one. No. We celebrate self-reliant spirits. We celebrate those who help themselves. But again, here comes Jesus. 
hey, if you want to be blessed, you've got to be poor in spirit. You've got to get to that point where you recognize your poverty. You've got to be able to say, God, I need help. Paul Little, he uses an analogy that I've liked to use before. He says, if you line a thousand people up on the shore of the Pacific Ocean and you tell them you need to swim to Hawaii, how many will make it? Nobody. Now, the dog paddler, he might go 10 yards. The Olympic swimmer, maybe 10 miles. But eventually, everyone is going to get lost. They're going to be worn out. They're going to get frustrated. And everyone's doomed because there's not a good enough swimmer to swim that distance. But say a cruise ship comes by and they say, we'll give a free trip to Hawaii to anybody who comes on board. So who makes it to the islands? Well, anybody who admits, I can't do it on my own. Now, the better the swimmer, the more difficult it is to swallow our pride, to admit that we need help. And the better a person is, the more moral or intellectual a person is, I think the harder it is for them to admit that they're spiritually bankrupt. And so my prayer for you, for me, is that we would be so lost, so tired, so frustrated trying to do this on our own, that we finally come to the end of our rope. God, I need help. Because it's at this point, again, that you and I are blessed. When we finally say, I can't do it, I can't mend my marriage, I can't fix my kids, I can't keep sober, I can't control my temper, I can't restrain my lust. I can't save myself. God, I can't do it. Help me. Blessed are you. The message puts it this way. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. Most of us think that it's not good to get to the end of our rope, to find ourselves in life where everything's fallen apart, where the pieces are pretty broken. But Jesus says, blessed are you when you reach that point. Because when you reach this point, you finally make room for God in your life. Seriously, seriously. But it's not easy for us. A survey one time asked people to quote their favorite Bible verse. And one of the most common verses quoted is this verse. You might know it. God helps those who, what? Who help themselves. Yeah, that's a great verse. That's nowhere in the Bible. It's simply not there. Do you know what the Bible would teach? The Bible would teach God help those who can't help themselves. That's who God helps. God helps those who ask for help. But most of us, we want to tell God, I got it, God. I got it. Now, if you study the life and the ministry of Jesus, you will see who gets blessed. It truly is the poor in spirit. In fact, a woman comes to Jesus whose body just won't stop bleeding. She spent all of her money on doctors. She's anemic, wasting away. She's at the end of her rope. So what she do? She admits it. And in desperation, she reaches out to Jesus for help. And she's blessed. The centurion whose servant is sick and paralyzed, he knows he doesn't even deserve to have Jesus come to his house. But he knows he has to try something. I mean, he's at the end of his rope. So he comes and he asks Jesus for help, and he's blessed. The Canaanite woman, no one's going to help her. She's an outsider, but her daughter, she's suffering horribly. And no one, no one's there. She's desperate. She's at the end of her rope. So she finally cries out to Jesus, Lord, help me. And he does. And she's blessed. It's in this very moment that we make room for God's blessing. There's some verses in Psalm 107 that praise the God who helps. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Some wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless, hungry and thirsty. They nearly died. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he rescued them from their distress. Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom, imprisoned in iron chains of misery. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. Some, they went off to sea in ships, and their ships were tossed to the heavens, and they plunged again to the depths. The sailors, they cringed in terror. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. 
and he calmed the storm to a whisper, and he stilled the waves. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Powerful words. Did you hear it? Three times they're in trouble, and what do they do? They cry out, Lord, help, and he does. Well, this is how Jesus begins the sermon. This is how he begins his public ministry. Blessed are you who've reached the end of your rope. Blessed are you who've come to realize that you can't help yourselves and you ask God for help. This might sound familiar because it's reflected in our last series on recovery. Step one, remember, admit we're not God. We're powerless. We need help. And we do. And I get it. It's hard for us to admit it. I desperately just want to give you three easy steps to become poor in the Spirit that each one of us can just do on our own. But being poor in spirit is not a task. It's not a list of things that I need to do. Instead, it's a humble cry for help. It's an admission that I can't, that I need God's help in my life. And so do you. So really, that's how I want us to end our time together today. I want to do something. I, I know it's a little bit different, but I want you to think about this bell. We ring these bells typically when we need help, right? Right? I mean, you go to a store during Christmas time, there's a Salvation Army volunteer, he's ringing a bell, right? He's going to let you know, hey, we need your help. If you go to a hotel or sometimes a store, there's a counter there, but no one's behind the counter, but sometimes they'll have this little bell on that counter and there'll be a note, hey, ring the bell if you need some help. And some of us, we don't do it, right? We don't want to be high maintenance, we don't want to be needy, so we just kind of wait there standing there. But you're supposed to ring the bell if you want help. As a kid, when we're really sick, mom would give us a little bell to ring. We'd re need her, so we ring that bell, and that lets her know that we need help. So really, that's what I want us to do today. I want you to ring a bell and let God know that we need help. In Mark 2, Jesus says this, healthy people, they don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come, he says, to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who think they are healthy, but those who know they are sinners, those who know they're sick. The point is this. If you want what Jesus has for you, you've got to be sick. Now, the truth is we're all sick, but some of us, we think we're well. We think we're healthy, and so we never want to ask for help. We don't ring the bell. So for the next few minutes, we're going to worship some more, but also put this into practice. And then practice what it means to be poor in spirit. And so set up around here at each of our campuses. Online, you're going to have to find one of those bells as an emoji. But we have some paper and pens. And on this paper, it just simply says this, Lord, help me with blank. And I just want you to write down in the area of your life where you're at the end of your rope and that you're willing to declare spiritual bankruptcy. An area in your life where you say, God, I need your help with this. And then just put it in the basket. And again, there's a bell next to it. Would you just ring it, right? And we're going to continue to worship. We're going to ask you to work all stand. We're going to move around. It's going to be different, but that's all right. But that's an acknowledgement that you can't do this by yourself, that you don't have the power, that you can't fix it, heal it, or redeem it. But you're asking God for his help. We also have these little crosses there. Take one of those as a reminder of this moment. So again, we're going to sing a couple songs. But that's what I want us to do during this time. Just allow this to be a time where we say, God, here's where I need your help. And we ring the bell. We say, God, please help me. Would you bow with me and let's pray. Father, thank you again for Jesus' powerful words that sometimes seem so contrary to what we think about happiness and being about blessed. So Lord, help us to be willing to admit that we need your help, that we'll ring the bell, and we'll do that in the name of Jesus. Thank you that you make a difference in our life. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling.
Each week we dedicate some time to acknowledge and celebrate the truth that Jesus died on the cross. And we don't just celebrate his death, but really it's the fact that he defeated death and he's the only one to do it. Overcoming death is what gives us confidence that we are loved and that grace is unconditionally offered to us. And that is why we do this each week. This is why we celebrate because Jesus showed us that life wins and death has been defeated and we are forever grateful. So we take this bread that represents his body that was nailed to a cross and we have this juice here that represents his blood that was spilled for our sake and, and we take that remembering his sacrifice. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your sacrifice and we know it leads to grace and we know it leads to unconditional love for us. You showed us that you would go to extreme, extreme measures to show us that there is life waiting for us, life to the full. And we thank you so much for that. Thank you for the time that we have this week to celebrate the fact that you went to the cross and to celebrate the fact that you defeated death. It is in your name that we pray, amen. Well, did you ring the bell? I mean, are you ready? Ready to admit that you need God's help. God, I need your help. I need your help. Well, we all do. And this is the way to God's blessing, to his kingdom. Remember, none of us have it figured out. And God loves you and he wants to help you. He wants to help you live that abundant life. The question is, will you ask him to help you? Will you trust him? If your answer is yes, if you ring the bell, then please let us know. If there's anything we can do to help, we want to help. If you want some prayer, let us know, we'll pray. So connect with your campus pastor, your host, with me, but let's start this journey on a blessed life. Now, just hang on for a couple more minutes and uh, we're gonna give you some other reminders of some great things that are coming up here at Northwest Christian Church.